Welcome to the Lymphoma Research Foundation's update on relapsed refractory mantle cell lymphoma webinar. My name is Jimena, and I'll be the operator for today's call. During today's call, you will hear an expert speaker, and you will have an opportunity to ask questions. If you have questions during the webinar, you can ask them at any time in the Q&A box on, on the screen. As a reminder, the webinar is being recorded. At the end of the program, a link will appear on your screen. Please follow this link to complete an evaluation of the program. If you are listening by phone, this link will be sent to you via email at the end of the webinar. And now I am pleased to introduce Jesse Brown. Jesse Brown is the Associate Director of Patient Education at the Lymphoma Research Foundation. Welcome, Jesse. Thank you. And thank you to each of you for taking the time to join us on today's update on relapsed refractory mantle cell lymphoma webinar. We'd like to thank our supporters of this webinar, AstraZeneca, Kite, a Gilead company, and Merck. Before I turn the program over to our speaker, I want to briefly share information with you on the Lymphoma Research Foundation. Access to expert disease information is so important, and we are thrilled to be able to bring you this educational program. LRF is the nation's largest nonprofit dedicated exclusively to lymphoma. Our mission is to eradicate this disease through investment in the most promising lymphoma research and to serve those impacted by lymphoma through quality education and support opportunities. As we continue to make progress in advancing lymphoma research, we also want to ensure that you have access to the latest information about your disease. The foundation provides comprehensive disease and treatment specific resources, programs, and services, all of which are offered free of charge and have been reviewed by lymphoma experts. Most relevant to today's call, LRF offers a variety of lymphoma specific resources, many of which you can access at the bottom of your screen if you're utilizing the web link or via LRF's website at lymphoma.org if you're on the phone. The LRF helpline can answer your specific questions about lymphoma as well as discuss relevant treatment options and clinical trials. We also offer the Lymphoma Support Network, which is a one-to-one -one peer support program for people with lymphoma and their caregivers. We offer a variety of publications that have been reviewed by lymphoma experts to ensure that you have access to the latest lymphoma information. This includes dedicated fact sheets on mantle cell lymphoma and a lymphoma care plan to help guide patients and their physicians discuss and document the cancer experience. Our mobile app, Focus on Lymphoma, is an award-winning app that provides patients and caregivers access to comprehensive content and unique tools to help manage your disease. And finally, we've launched our COVID-19 Learning Center to support lymphoma patients and caregivers through these challenging times. To learn more about these MCL-specific resources, or if you have questions regarding what you heard about today, you can reach out to LRF through our website at lymphoma.org or by calling our helpline at 1-800-500-9976. We have a wonderful program planned for you today, and I'm honored to introduce you to Dr. Alexei Danilov. Dr. Danilov is a hematologist and oncologist at City of Hope, where he's the Associate Director of the Tony Stevenson Lymphoma Center. He's also a professor in the Division of Lymphoma. Thank you so much, Dr. Danilov, for speaking at our program today. I will now turn the talk over to you. Hi. Uh, good, uh, good afternoon. Hopefully everyone can hear me. And uh, today we will talk about uh, relapsed refractory mental cell lymphoma. And uh, first I would like to, to start by uh, thanking the Lymphoma Research Foundation for everything they do. They have quite a range of activities. Um, they support established investigators with uh, grants advancing their research. They also have programs for junior faculty trainees in the medical field. Um, they have programs for uh, for nursing, and uh, this is one of this is uh, today's program is an important part of what uh, what Lymphoma Research Foundation does in uh, support of. Uh, patients afflicted with uh, lymphoma. And of course, this is a foundation which is specifically dedicated to lymphoma research, uh, improvement of uh, lives of patients with lymphoma. So I would like to thank them for organizing multiple programs uh, spanning all sorts of uh, areas which are important uh, for the field of lymphoma. Um, <coughs> anyway, so <coughs> A brief introduction is uh, um, the lymphoma is a uh, essentially a tumor of the lymph nodes and vessels 
the lymph nodes are spread out uh, through the whole body. And uh, therefore, many lymphomas, when they initially start, they immediately become what we call systemic diseases affecting multiple areas of the body. Even if we don't see lymphoma involvement by uh, standard imaging techniques that we typically use, such as CT scan or PET scan, um, often we presume that um, lymphoma is, uh, is involving multiple sites, and so many patients who come to us, they already have uh, what we call stage 3 or 4, uh, advanced stage lymphoma. This is particularly true for mental cell lymphoma, which often presents at multiple sites involving multiple lymph nodes. Um, so related to that, the presenting symptoms would be lymphadenopathy, what we call, or swelling of the lymph nodes, which some often can be felt um, uh, in the surface area of the body. Um, many uh, folks with mental cell lymphoma also have accompanying symptoms which uh, impact their lifestyle, such as night sweats, weight loss, and fever. Um, <coughs> these are <coughs> pretty common in mental cell lymphoma. At, present, at initial diagnosis and at subsequent relapses. Um, and then fatigue, which often creeps up over a period of uh, many months. Um, and often patients say that only after they get treated, they realize how fatigued they were before treatment and how much things improve improve after treatment treatment has started. Because often, um, as fatigue progresses very slowly, uh, many of us don't notice that um, uh, something is wrong. And rarely for mental cell lymphoma, unlike some other um, uh, lymph lymphoid malignancies, rarely we detect uh, mental cell lymphoma as an accidental diagnosis as part of some routine workup performed in the primary care physician's office, which, um, which finds presence of abnormal lymphocytes. So like I said, we can fill the lymph nodes. Uh, the spleen is, uh, is often, can often be involved, uh, so we can fill the enlarged spleen. Um, and uh, what we really need to establish diagnosis is the excisional biopsy, or at least a thick uh, needle biopsy. This is, uh, this is how um, uh, variants of uh, mental cell lymphoma, what variants of mental cell lymphoma can look like. Basically, they're smaller blue cells. Uh, one uh, feature of mental cell lymphoma is that it can involve gastrointestinal tract, both um, at the initial diagnosis and at relapse. We don't look for it necessarily, but one out of five patients, roughly, if you begin looking, we will find uh, lymphoma in the gastrointestinal uh, 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 system. <clears throat> and uh, one of the key features of mental cell lymphoma is so-called translocation 1114, where cyclin D1 is the protein, which is one of the drivers uh, of mental cell lymphoma, uh, which forces the cells to uh, divide more often than, 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 than it is necessary for the lymphocytes. The typical diagnosis is established by flow cytometry, where you look at surface markers, and basically this represents essentially a barcode on a cell. Each cell in a body carries this, this barcode. Some of them are better described than others, but for mental cell lymphoma specifically, we really do know what the cells are supposed to be to look like. 99% of the time, they conform to our expectations. And maybe 1% of the time, the cells don't read our books and uh, do something different. And that's when um, finding uh, cycling D1 over expression, either by staining or by genetic studies, becomes really important. But even before then, we often suspect mental cell lymphoma uh, just based on this particular surface signature in the cells. Um, um, so there are two main types of mental cell lymphoma. One of them is classical, which is 90% of everyone, and 10% is leukemic non-nodal mental cell lymphoma, which typically behaves more like CLL, another uh, slow-growing condition. And uh, classical mental cell lymphoma also has the subtypes of blastoid and pleomorphic, which typically tends to be a little bit um, 
uh, a little bit harder to treat and becomes relapsed or, uh, after initial treatment, so it is refractory to initial treatments, particularly chemotherapy, uh, more often than not. Um, but um, the, the, what we typically talk about is classical mental cell lymphoma that presents with lymphadenopathy, sometimes splenomegaly, and uh, a, a plethora of symptoms. And the other one, leukemic non-nodal, is the one which is typically uh, found on um, on a routine blood count. There are some several prognostic factors out there. KI-67 is the proliferative index, and the higher it is typically, um, uh, the, the less well the disease may behave. And then mental cell uh, international prognostic index looks at a multitude of several factors. Again, to highlight that plastoid mental cell um, and uh, is uh, is one of the typical one of the subtypes which is fairly difficult to treat, and often it is related to the fact that this blastoid mental cell may carry high risk genetic abnormalities, particularly p53 mutations and so-called complex carrier types. So these are so-called Kaplan micros. Um, many of you already know how to look at it, and if not, basically the the more horizontal the curve the better the survival of uh, patients with that particular subtype. So you can see the blue line here is fairly flat over, over the period of years. There is a long time of observation on the x-axis in years, and the curve is reasonably flat, whereas the red curve drops off very quickly, and that's because these patients had P53 mutation in this older study. So we do better than that now, and I'll explain why. But this is the P53 mutation. This is a, a very important gene which is responsible for um, killing the cells if something goes wrong. Uh, if they, if somehow, for example, if there is DNA damage, introduction of new mutations into the genetic material, which make the cell really unstable. And P53, this particular protein, is supposed to initiate a cascade of reactions, which ultimately kills the cell. When it's mutated, it doesn't do that, and so then the cell is prone to accumulate all these other uh, uh, genetic mutations which help it survive indefinitely. Complex karyotype is sort of a similar concept where multiple random mutations are acquired, resulting in uh, multiple rearrangement of the chromosomal material, uh, ultimately leading to this uh, uh, enhanced survival of the cells. So these two particular types, even today, are not, we are not we, we are discouraged to treat them with chemotherapy and uh, autologous stem cell transplant. So I actually did update. Okay, so this is not my most updated slide, sorry, but it does show what you need to know. So we still think of mental cell lymphoma in two ways, whether the patient is a transplant candidate or not. If the patient is a transplant candidate, meaning that um, uh, they are younger, they don't have medical comorbidities, there is not necessarily an age cutoff. At City of Hope, we sometimes go as high as 75, but at most centers, it's 65, 70 is the age cutoff after which transplant is no longer offered. Um, um, so in, in younger patients who have no medical problems, we typically use chemotherapy followed by autologous stem cell transplant, which is just a fancy way of giving more chemotherapy. And in older patients or folks who have uh, multiple medical problems who are not good candidates for high-dose intensive chemotherapy, then we use uh, low-intensity regimens, some of which are listed here. Bindamacin rituximab is uh, the prime example. So in disease which has P53 aberration, we don't really do transplant anymore. So there, uh, there is a third category here, which is not listed, listed on, on this current slide. So um, the issue with uh, mental cell lymphoma is none of the frontline therapies that we have are curative. So we cannot cure it with chemotherapy. And as we go into subsequent lines, um, our, the chemotherapies become less and less and less and less effective. And this is shown here in two graphs. General survival is on the left, 
and progression-free survival, meaning efficacy of the regimen is on the right. And as you can see, line, the first line is the red line. If you count from that, it's fairly effective. Chemotherapy is fairly effective. And as we go to second line, third line, blue, green, uh, and orange line, ultimately, um, chemotherapy becomes less and less effective, and we don't derive as much benefit from it. So, so that's, of course, a problem, um, and uh, that's why we have uh, multiple novel therapies have been designed to treat relapsed refractory mental cell lymphoma. So once, once, uh, uh, once a patient hits this sort of four- or five-year interval following chemotherapy, this is where they become at particular risk of progression and becoming relapsed uh, after initial treatment of mental cell lymphoma, where we need to use some alternative strategies. And um, for this reason that I've shown you, this curves are not behaving so well, we really don't use chemotherapy much in treatment of relapsed refractory mental cell lymphoma anymore. There are several, of, several classes of agents which I'm listing here. I listed chemotherapy still in red. We sometimes do it very rarely, but that's really by far not the standard. Um, we have two classes of BTK inhibitors, two general classes of BTK inhibitors available now, the covalent ones, cibrutinib, acalabrutinib, and zanobrutinib, which are all FDA-approved in this disease, and non-covalent pirtabrutinib, which just recently was approved in mental cell lymphoma as well. We have something which is really fancy called chimeric antigen receptor T cells or CAR T cells. You may have heard that term. This is a completely different class of drugs which acts by a mechanism very distinct from BTK inhibitors. Then we have immune modulators, lenalidomide. We maybe use it less often than the other modalities. And there are some really exciting uh, uh, agents now uh, in clinical trials, such as by specific antibodies. There is BCL2 inhibitor, veniraclax, which has some efficacy in mental cell lymphoma, and antibody drug conjugates. So targeted therapies is really where we go uh, first when, when, when we see a patient with mental cell lymphoma who progressed after initial chemotherapy. And design of targeted therapies has come from an understanding that lymphoma cell is, is, is very dependent on certain proteins um, in its survival. So the chemotherapy damages the DNA, it damages the genetic material indiscriminately. Uh, meanwhile, uh, targeted therapy does not damage DNA. It doesn't have, as far as we know, increased risk of second cancers, uh, but it actually targets uh, certain signaling processes within the cell. Um, it sort of disrupts the electric circuit, which, um, which, which feeds the cell and provides energy for its survival. And um, it's something called the B-cell receptor, which, where the cell may be responding to some unknown uh, entity in the environment, uh, in, the tum in the tumor microenvironment, not necessarily in uh, in, 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 in the outside, in, in the outdoors environment. But, or it can just be signaling indiscriminately without any sort of stimulus for one reason or another. And this is where the targeted therapy has, has made the most success is by targeting this B-cell receptor uh, signaling. So free BTK inhibitors, BTK is a kinase which belongs to the B-cell receptor signaling pathway. It's one of the nodes in this electrical circuit which feeds the cell. And three BTK inhibitors have been approved in, uh, for multiple indications. Ibrutinib has been around for, for 10 years now, uh, quite quite unbelievably. Uh, Acalabrutinib was the second one approved in the setting, and Zanobrutinib was uh, approved fairly recently for mental cell lymphoma and just gained full approval for CLL um, as well. Um, Ibrutinib was the first BTK inhibitor which was used in MCL. This was an old study uh, published 10 years ago where about 100 patients with mental cell lymphoma who progressed uh, after about three therapies, which is quite a lot of chemotherapy for mental cell lymphoma, just received um, ibrutinib, uh, which is essentially uh, one pill a day, 560 milligrams per day. So, And uh, most patients responded in one way or another. The overall response rate was about 70%, but it was really high. It just had to do with how they actually defined response, but most patients benefited on that study. And this was a huge advancement because 
uh, these patients uh, needed to be needed to stay alive. They needed to be exposed to multiple chemotherapy, immunotherapy drug combinations uh, associated with infections, um, um, immune suppression, uh, multiple other side effects. And here there was one pill which did a better job than any chemotherapy ever did in this in these patients with relapsed mental cell lymphoma. And uh, uh, responses were high, and uh, uh, most patients remained in response for up to two years. Again, for after three lines of therapy, that's quite an achievement because even with hardcore chemotherapy, we rarely achieve a year. And part of that year, patients are coming to the clinic getting this therapy. So this was certainly a, a, a huge improvement. And uh, there, was, there are still some patients, about 40% of them, who are at the very tail end of this curve, um, who are still, who has, still have not progressed. I certainly have patients who have been on abrutinib for four, five years and are still doing well. So it doesn't, and the, the, other, the other thing is the earlier you use ibrutinib, the better patients do. So if you use it after one prior line of therapy, the curve is pretty horizontal. This is the red curve. If you use it in folks who have received more than one prior line of therapy, the, the curve is less horizontal, right? So the curve drops off faster, meaning that these patients progress fast, faster. So this this data is really a reason to avoid using chemotherapy again and again in patients who come back with mental cell lymphoma, because as you use more chemotherapy, you introduce more genetic changes. Uh, the cell gets more opportunities to mutate, gain survival advantage during the DNA damage, during the gene damage of genetic material, which is induced by chemotherapy. So really, almost no patient with mental cell lymphoma should receive chemotherapy after the after they progress uh, and become relapsed. So this and this uh, the, uh, BTK inhibitors really have become um, a standard in that particular uh, circumstance. A calabrutinib is another BTK inhibitor, very similar study run almost at the same time, maybe a couple of a year later or so, also about 100 patients. At this point, the patients were already a little bit less heavily pretreated. They had two prior chemotherapy lines as opposed to three. Uh, response rate was 80%, so almost everybody responded. 40% uh, of patients achieved complete response, meaning that disease could not be detected after treatment with acalabrutinib. The other feature about acalabrutinib is that it is better tolerated than ibrutinib. And we, we know that now from other studies in another disease called uh, CLL, chronic lymphocytic leukemia, there were randomized studies showing that uh, uh, acalabrutinib has better tolerance, uh, better safety profile in CLL, and that's probably true in mental cell lymphoma as well. Of course, patients with CLL can stay on these drugs for five, six, seven years often. Um, with mental cell lymphoma, unfortunately, the efficacy may not be as prolonged, but nevertheless, um, the, the acalabrutinib as a second generation PTK inhibitor does perform better in terms of safety in um, in, CL, in mental in in uh, lymphoid malignancies. Um, of course, the better, the deeper the response you achieve, the better the outcomes. So what you have on the red line here is uh, this particular study had enough patients who cleared mental cell lymphoma on a calabrutinib. The time it work it does work pretty fast. In general, about two months before disease clearance can be achieved. And so the red line here, the most horizontal line, is showing how patients do if they achieve complete response, meaning they clear disease um, on a calabrutinib. And this, this line is uh, performing quite well, so patients stay on treatment longer before they progress. And of course, the black line is progressive disease, and the blue line in the middle is partial response. So folks who achieve partial response don't quite fully clear their disease but they derive benefit, uh, ultimately they do progress faster, which of course is not necessarily unexpected, right? The better the drug works, the longer it typically would work. So same situation though, just like with the brutinib, there was about one third of patients who 
um, still with progression three after three years. Again, in a setting where these folks received much chemotherapy before um, and required multiple drugs given at the same time to essentially stay alive. This is a huge achievement for just a small pill. And uh, finally, there were a couple of phase two studies of zanobrutinib in relapsed refractory mental cell lymphoma. This is also a second generation BTK inhibitor, which also is safer than ibrutinib in studies um, uh, performed in chronic lymphocytic leukemia. I would believe that it's also true in mental cell lymphoma. So um, I would say most of us now switch to prescribing zanobrutinib and acalabrutinib as second generation BTK inhibitors for patients with mental cell lymphoma. Although if I have folks who do really well on abrutinib, I don't switch. Uh, there is plenty of patients for whom abrutinib has worked well and has been life-saving. But so in these studies too, um, this agent seems to have similar efficacy to both acalabrutinib and zanobrutinib. Um, high overall response rate of close to 90%, and it also works on average for about two years, and just like with other drugs, for patients who achieve deep responses, who clear mental cell lymphoma, are more likely to experience long time before they progress on this drug. All of these drugs are given continuously, Unlike chemotherapy, which we give for, say, five, six months and then we stop, uh, all of these BTK inhibitors are given uh, continuously or, or until progression or until unfavorable adverse um, events. And uh, still early data, um, because these drugs have, have still have not been around that long, but uh, what what this data shows, uh, and I only I think it will only get better as, uh, with time, is that uh, people who take uh, uh, BTK inhibitors in this particular case, ibrutinib, and first relapse, they actually survive longer uh, than people who are treated with chemotherapy um, in the second line. Uh, so again, another reason to use BTK inhibitors in first relapse. Now we also have pirtabrutinib approval. So pirtabrutinib is a little bit of a different animal. Another name for it is LOXO305. It's different in the sense that it works differently. It doesn't have the same binding pocket in the BTK, which is its target. So BTK relies on binding energy molecule called ATP to perform its function. So what ibrutinib, acalabrutinib, uh, do is they actually fill that, fill that little pocket where ATP is supposed to bind and prevent BTK from getting energy. So BTK has learned to circumvent that issue by mutating some of the um, amino acids uh, in that binding pocket so the, that ibrutinib, acalabrutinib can no longer bind. And instead of becoming irreversible inhibitors, knocking out BTK forever, they become reversible, they dissociate, and then BTK can function again. So pirtabrutinib circumvents this issue. It doesn't care whether BTK has mutated in that initial energy binding site or not. And uh, they had some preclinical data using BTK, the classic mutant that we see emerge in patients who progress on ibrutinib. It's on the right side, BTKC481S. It's just the site where amino acid is mutated. And um, in their preclinical data in mice and in, in, in cells, they have shown that pirtabrutinib actually works in this particular setting where BTK is mutated. And then they ran a study called Bruin. It was a really large study which enrolled hundreds of patients with CLL and uh, mental cell lymphoma. Uh, they have close to 100 patients with mental cell lymphoma now, and the uh, vast majority of them progressed on a BTK inhibitor before they went on the study. Um, so there was a time before CAR T cells were introduced where patients who progressed on BTK inhibitors really didn't have good options. And some of those patients are here in the study. And what you can see that the majority of patients actually did benefit 
from going on pirtabrutinib after they progressed on abrutinib. So the majority here progressed on abrutinib, but the mechanism of resistance for acalabrutinib and zanabrutinib is substantially the same. So what you see here is called a waterfall plot, um, and on the right side is the actual waterfall, uh, which shows how much the lymph node size has decreased in percentage points from the baseline before the drug was studied to uh, the subsequent scan when um, patients have received the drug for two or three or four months, uh, depending when this when particular scan was performed. So what you can see here is most patients experienced a negative value, meaning that the lymph nodes are reduced, have reduced by up to 100% in some occasional cases. For most patients, we don't... Um, you know, for m many patients, complete response is not achieved, um, but um, about half of the patients did qualify for a uh, for, for response criteria. Some patients had some response, but didn't quite make the 50% mark. Uh, there are there are a few of these patients shown here. You know, in the middle of the in the middle of the graph, but they still derived some clinical benefit. Um, so. Um, so this is certainly an exciting new agent, which was just approved for therapy of mental cell lymphoma. Then there is venetoclax. Venetoclax works through a completely different mechanism. Venetoclax targets mitochondrial function. And uh, um, those of you who still might remember high school biology lessons, mitochondrial mitochondria is actually an energy, uh, an energy station within the cell. This is what produces... Um, this is what shuttles oxygen. That's why we breathe oxygen. This is what shuttles oxygen around and produces these uh, molecules of energy that I actually mentioned before called ATP. Um, and the, the function of mitochondrion is very tightly regulated by so-called BCL2 proteins. So the orange one, the BCL2, is in the middle. Um, and that's what venetoclax blocks. And uh, somehow lymphoma cells mental cell lymphoma cells in particular, are, very, are, partic are particularly dependent on this BCL2 protein, unlike normal cells, which can quite well survive absence of this protein and still generate energy. Lymphoma cells uh, are very, very dependent on it. So once BCL2 is inhibited by venetoclax, the energy in a cell can all, no longer be produced and the cell dies. So as a single agent, this agent, the venetoclax, is a little bit underwhelming in patients with mental cell lymphoma. However, um, we have some combination trials which use venetoclax in combination with other agents. Um, and uh, um, it can actually produce quite significant uh, uh, responses in patients with mental cell lymphoma, even after uh, prog those who progress on brutantrizin kinase inhibitors. This agent hasn't been approved yet. Uh, the development path seems to be pretty tortuous there, but uh, it's a pill um, also, and uh, like I said, it does work in mental cell lymphoma, and we have used it off-label in many a patient. Even though it's approved in CLL only, we sometimes are able to get it either through clinical trial or through the insurance for patients with mental cell lymphoma. So this is also a new development, um, a very exciting drug, uh, which has actually changed uh, lives of patients with CLL, acute myeloid leukemia, other hematologic malignancies. Uh, what has made a lot of splash recently is so-called T-cell enabling therapies. Um, and uh, CAR T-cells in relapsed mental cell has really made a lot of impact in the past few years. Uh, the way this therapy works is um, T-cells from patients with mental cell lymphoma are harvested, armored with a virus which teaches them to recognize their own lymphoma. So um, unfortunately, lymphoma has evaded, has learned how to evade the immune system. It is a foreign body, in a sense. These cells, in the amount that they exist in, in, in a human body, should not really be there. But because it comes from the same body, right, um, um, the immune system doesn't recognize it as foreign because they carry all the typical, typical signatures 
which uh, make the immune system recognize it as as as, as your own. So what CAR T what what happens here is first CAR T cells are harvested from the blood through the process called apheresis. Then they are put in a petri dish and I expand it. Then they are infected with a virus, and the virus uh, has a construct, a vector, which which recognizes a molecule molecule called CD19, which is present on mantle cell lymphoma cells. And then the cells are expanded for a couple of weeks once they are armed with this virus, and they are put back into a human body. So it sounds pretty scary, virus back in a human body, but this virus is actually devoid of, rep of uh, re what we call replication. So it cannot proliferate, even if it wanted to. Um, the virus uh, does not have a mechanism to replicate itself. So it only exists in one copy. It only can be expanded within the T cells. Um, and the T cells do have a lifespan. Eventually they will die. They circulate in, in the human body for three, four months, but eventually they die off and uh, stop expanding once the lymphoma is under control. So the virus goes away together with the T cells. It doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't, it's not harbored in the human body. And uh, this was by far the most successful treatment in relapsed uh, mental cell lymphoma. So the drug called Brexacel is approved in treatment of relapsed MCL. And what you can see here that 90% of patients had a response and actually 80% in light green had complete response, meaning that uh, in 80% of patients, um, uh, the disease disappeared completely within a period of one or two months. Median time to response is about a month. Okay, so most pa in most patients you cannot see mental cell lymphoma just a month later. And um, again, all of these were patients who were who had received multiple treatments, three therapy lines, many three different chemotherapy regimens, and most of them actually progressed on ibrutinib. 80% progressed on ibrutinib. For some patients, it still doesn't work. Those about uh, uh, less than 10% of patients, but that's still a possibility. Um, but for the vast majority, it induces really dramatic responses, this CAR T cell therapy. Um, Will it be durable? Well, still hard to say. So this is the initial data. For most patients, it works for a, for longer than a year. The current update, which was a three-year update presented at the last ASH meeting and just recently published, suggests that about half of the patients will be disease-free disease three, four years later. And that's as much as we have. So we still don't know what happens after four years because this treatment has only been around for four years. So um, have we cured anybody with CAR T cells? We would like to think that, but uh, we don't know yet. So what, what is happening now is many, many patients who have high-risk disease, who have P53 abnormalities, we have studies, so we accept a strategy where we try to introduce CAR T cells early because these patients are so difficult to treat when they progress after initial therapy. Uh, one feature of uh, this treatment regimen is that it's not, it's not that it's not necessarily very easy to give, unlike BTK inhibitors, which they do have side effects, but they are all very manageable. Um, this treatment is given in the hospital. Uh, about 30-40% of patients develop some toxicities. Uh, there are two particular toxicities which are uh, classically associated with this therapy. One is called cytokine release syndrome. Uh, which is associated with T cell with expansion of these T cells in or CAR T cells in the human body. They secrete multiple what we call cytokines. They secrete multiple noxious uh, substances, uh, which are designed, of course, to kill the lymphoma. But at the same time, they can make the patient feel really unwell. There'll be fevers. Blood pressure can drop. Uh, fevers can be really high, 40, 41 Celsius sometimes. So um, there are some additional medications that patients can get, such as tocilizumab, which is uh, specifically designed to ablate the cytokine storm. 
So cytokine release syndrome is one complication. Another complication is neurotoxicity. In particular, this product, Brexocell, is associated with a quite significant rate of uh, neurotoxicity. Uh, every, every third patient will have high-grade neurotoxicity, which means confusion, uh, short-term memory loss. Um, these are all transient. So the vast majority of patients uh, who leave the hospital live with healthy and normal, but there is a period of seven, 10 days while they're in the hospital where they may not know where they are. They may not know how to write. Um, they may not recognize their loved ones. So it can be quite stressful. But like I said, it all goes away um, uh, by, the, by the end of the hospital stay. Um, but that's also the reason why this, uh, these patients need to stay in the hospital to manage a lot of these uh, complications. So not 100% benign therapy, but um, something which all the patients can do well with as well. And of course, infections are still a possibility with this, uh, with this type of therapies. So now uh, we are heading from, oops, sorry. So now we are heading from a uh, area of approved therapies to unapproved therapies, and uh, the new kit of, on the block is the bispecific antibodies. Um, so bispecific antibodies are actually approved in therapy of follicular lymphoma, but it, it has taken a more tortuous path in terms of uh, treatment of mental cell lymphoma for a variety of reasons. The particular way, <coughs> the way these agents work is they consist of two parts. They consist of two parts. They still, uh, then uh, the, one, one, one side of the molecule of the antibody will bind the T cell, and the either side of the antibody here shown in red will bind the target cell, which is the lymphoma cell. So they basically what they do is they force the T cell, the immune cell, and the lymphoma cell to kiss each other. And this is a kiss of death, typically, for the lymphoma cell, because um, as I told you, the lymphoma cell learns to, to avoid immune surveillance. But once you introduce this antibody, once you approximate the T cell to the lymphoma cell, they have no choice but to be close to each other. And then the T cell realizes that, oh, this is not supposed to be here. It gets activated by this by specific antibody, and uh, just like a CAR T cell uh, releases all this noxious stuff, which ultimately kills the lymphoma cell. <clears throat> so immediate advantages over CAR T cells, you don't need to make it from a human body. They are available off the shelf. By specific antibodies just can be made in a lab and given to any patient, unlike CAR T cells, where you have to harvest the T cell cell first uh, and now armor them with the virus, put them back in. This is just like any other drug. You reach for a shelf and uh, hang the infusion, and there it goes. Um, so, uh, and they also seem to be very effective. There are, oops, there are uh, four different antibodies right now. Blinatumumab is the original one, long time was introduced long time ago in therapy of acute lymphoblastic leukemia. But there are three which are <clears throat> in fairly fast development, there are a couple more. Well, not there are dozens more, let's put it this way, which are in development. But these three are at the front line uh, of development. Masunatuzumab in the center is approved for therapy of follicular lymphoma. Glyphitamab is uh, developed quite um, ag aggressively, let's say, for therapy of mental cell lymphoma. Apcaritumab um, is a little behind in that space. So my colleague, Tysel Phillips, who is also at City of Hope, actually presented this data of glyphitamab in relapsed refractory mental cell lymphoma. It works so well that before you give this drug, you actually have to block some of this CD20 receptors by uh, abinituzumab, a CD20 antibody, so that the drug does not induce too much cytokine storm. But what you see here is response rates, and they are as high as CAR T cells. Um, the only, and also patients who progressed on BTK inhibitors seem to respond as well. The um, this toxicities are less than CAR T cells. There is still a possibility of cytokine release, release syndrome, uh, which you see with CAR T cell therapy. That's again related to release of noxious stimuli by the T cells, which are being induced to kill the lymphoma cell. 
but it overall seems to, it tends to be lower grade than what you see with CAR T cells. There is not much in terms of neurotoxicity with this particular drug. <clears throat> so, the, like I said, the immediate advantage is it is off the shelf. Um, whether it's going to be as durable as CAR T cell responses, whether there is hope that we cured somebody, I think that's probably less hope. Uh, uh, for that, um, but, and um, I suspect the responses might be less durable with this particular drug, but nevertheless, um, they work after CAR T cells, they work before CAR T cells, so uh, certainly a very welcome agent to develop alone, and, uh, alone or a combination with, uh, in, for patients with mental cell lymphoma. There are several other agents in development which I won't necessarily talk about today. I just wanted to share the most exciting news with you. Um, so I'll say that newly diagnosed MCL still we use chemoimmunotherapy and transplant. It's a whole different talk whether or not to use transplant in that setting. We won't talk about that today. I will say that patients who have mutated TP53 should not get chemotherapy and transplant, <coughs> well, with some with some exceptions. Um, but ideally, they would be treated on a clinical trial or with novel therapies if possible. If they do get chemotherapy, they should really get low-intensity chemotherapy. That is the exception I'm talking about. Uh, BTK inhibitors is really the most accepted second-line option. And then uh, we have multiple uh, agents in clinical trials that I mentioned, which, uh, will, uh, which will improve therapy of uh, patients with MCL in the coming years. So we may be moved to the question, uh, question and answer section now. Great, thank you so much, Dr. Danilov. Um, we'll get to the Q and A portion. We have about 15 minutes for some questions. Um, we will try to get to everyone's. Um, just a reminder: please make your questions as general as possible. We can't um, usually answer, you know, treatment diagnosis um, specific questions to you um, on the webinar. So we will get started. Um, someone asked, I is the incident... I can see some of them in the chat if you want me to read them. Um, sure, yeah, but... that works well. Okay, so if, if that's where you see your questions as well, I think I can, I can read them. So I'll, I'll start Great. from the top. Mm -hmm. So are there any trials using pirtabrutinib in second-line treatment? So yes, they re there are, pirtabrutinib has been now in multiple clinical trials in both CLL mental cell lymphoma uh, in mental cell lymphoma, specifically, there is a phase three trial where patients get randomized to either pirtabrutinib or one of the old BTK inhibitors, ibrutinib, acalabrutinib, zonabrutinib, depending on the, the choice of the treating physician. So uh, there is also a trial combining in, uh, pirtabrutinib with venetoclax. So yes, these trials are certainly out there, and um, yeah. Um, it's been investigated in earlier lines of therapy. Um, the mechanisms of resistance to pirtabrutinib are a bit different. So the big question becomes, if somebody gets pirtabrutinib and they need, say, ibrutinib later once they progress, will ibrutinib work? So that's the question, right? Because some of the mutations in BTK that we find in patients who develop resistance to pirtabrutinib, they at the same time become resistant to ibrutinib. So, but anyway, so with that, with that's, that's all, of course, what the clinical trial will also answer, but then maybe uh, uh, pirtabrutinib will work for much longer, so then you do not need to sequence these agents like, what, like we do now. Anyway, so there is a lot of questions, not a whole lot of answers, but yes, these trials are ongoing. I'm currently in a pirtabrutinib um, clinical trial and doing well, what is the range of probable response and long as possible. Well, so congratulations on doing well, that's great. Um, there is not a whole lot of information. In fact, as, the, as uh, more and more patients are added to the pirtabrutinib, because not all of these patients have all the response assessments, uh, the latest data that we saw, the duration of responses was, uh, was, uh, was actually shorter than initially reported. But the initially reported duration of response was, you know, close to 15, 16 months. There are patients who go longer than that. 15, 16 months is roughly the average. There are patients who go longer than that. So I don't really know what, what is the longest possible. Um, uh, it could be something similar to 
other BTK inhibitors where we have patients going on for five, six years. <clears throat> so I think it's it's probably possible depending on um, on on your situation before you started it. What possible treatments might follow if pirtaburtinib ceases to be effective? Uh, also, the question from Francis. So, uh, like like what I've mentioned, uh, there there is option if CAR T cells have not been used yet. CAR T cells are possible. There are allergen A CAR T cells. There are natural killer CARs. There are bispecific antibodies, uh, BTK degraders. So there are actually at least five, six treatments that we have here in clinical trials, just at City of Hope, that can be used. Um, um, so in terms of watch and wait in follicular lymphoma, this is uh, not quite the relapsed uh, topic, but yes, uh, the studies have shown that watch and wait is safe, um, and watch and wait can continue for a year, for many months sometimes. On average, it's about a year, but I have patients who have been in watch and wait stage for three years. I will say, you know, almost everyone invariably progresses sooner or later, but it's certainly safe to continue watch and wait just like CLL. Um, it, it's it's uh, not a problem. Uh, and treating it early without symptoms does not necessarily um, achieve achieve that much. Um, so, like I said, it's okay to watch and wait. That's been proven. Uh, what is the best latest treatment for induction? Well, so what, what we typically do here, it really depends on age. It depends on many, many things. There are two regimens which I use most often. One is uh, Nordic regimen, which is alter alternating R-CHOP with uh, cytarabine. That's mostly for younger patients. Many of us now just simply use bendamustin rituximab, even for younger patients, planning autologous stem cell transplant. So it's either of those two regimens, uh, followed by autologous stem cell transplant, still the standard, um, sort of across the board, but again, it depends on a particular uh, situation. Is the incidence of treatment like lenalidomide higher for secondary cancer or, 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 like AML? So, um, so I guess the question is, is, is lenalidomide associated with secondary cancer? So that's been going back and forth. Um, and the general answer is probably not. Um, um, lenalidomide rituximab is, or lenalidomide abinutuzumab is a very appropriate induction for mental cell lymphoma. Not as much experience with it as with chemotherapy, and lenalidomide is not that easy. Um, um, it can have a lot of side effects. Um, so, so the aggregate data suggests that in lymphoma, probably not a whole lot of secondary cancers. This drug uh, is extensively used in myeloma as well. Um, so I wouldn't say that that would be a deciding factor. I'd say that uh, risks would be uh, lower than with chemotherapy, if I had to guess. Could you please share on CAR T cell therapy on mental cell lymphoma? So I think I did that. Um, there are, in addition to approved CAR T cells, there are multiple others which use slightly different vectors. Like I said, there are allergen A CAR T cells, so quite quite a few things. Do you recommend that patients with complete response from initial therapy have periodic PET scans or CT scans? So 13 years out from stem cell transplant is impressive. I wouldn't start now. Um, um, you know, it really depends on how, we, in general, it's not mandated, let's put it this way. So for many patients, we don't do regular scans because it's associated with radiation and often we detect relapses between the scans anyway. So it's not really standard, a standard thing to do. For some patients of whom we are particularly worried because of their genetic status, um, we may do a few scans here and there. Uh, it sounds like for him, 13 years after stem cell transplant, that's, that's a long time. It's really great efficacy, so transplant still works. So I wouldn't start scanning now. Um, which brand is better? So the current brand uh, which is approved is Brexicel, which is Tecartis, and that was studied in Zuma, Zuma 2. I guess Carta is approved for 
uh, DLBCL, ALL. So there are multiple CAR T cells out there, but the CAR test is the one which is we use most, most frequently for mental cell lymphoma of clinical trial. Um, allogeneic transplant after the relapse, yes, it's still an option. Um, it's certainly still an option, particularly for younger patients. Um, I think um, most of us consider CAR T cells first. And there are re the reasons for that are, one, many of our patients who come with relapsed mental cell lymphoma are older, and they are not great candidates for autologous, so for allogeneic stem cell transplant. The second issue is allogeneic stem cell transplant is a very toxic procedure. Um, it has a 20% risk of dying, right? It also has other complications like chronic graft-versus-host graft disease, which about half of the patients undergoing transplant are afflicted with. So it's no walk on the ocean base. CAR T-cells cells have some toxicities, but they're transient. So even for younger patients, I would try CAR T-cells first before going to allo transplant. <clears throat> um, CD20 in my biopsy, in not CD19. So usually they would test for CD19 as well. Um, maybe they didn't expli explicitly state it, but all mental cell lymphoma typically expresses CD19. So particularly, sometimes lymphoma can lose CD19 after CAR T cells, but really it would be highly unusual before CAR T cells. <coughs> Uh, blastoid variant of MCL is always more aggressive than indolent. Yes, blastoid variant is typically uh, one which is also associated with P53 abnormalities and would have more relapse and worse outcomes. Um, bispecific antibodies should follow CAR T cell therapy. Yes, possibly. Uh, it, they, they can also be used before CAR T cell therapy. It depends on how the clinical trial is written. None of them are currently are approved. But yes, certainly it. It can be an option either way. <clears throat> Could CAR T cell be used after glafitumab fails? Um, yeah, why not? So glafitumab targets CD20, CAR T cell targets CD19. So, so yes, in principle, yes. Um, what is the difference between bispecific antibodies and rituximab? So rituximab only targets CD20. It doesn't have a part which would which would recruit the T cell as much. It has it, it's a complicated immunology story. It has some some particular sequences on its um, uh, on its base fragment, which can recruit monocytes, for example. But it's not as a stro as strong a recruiter as a CD3 component of the bispecific antibody. So it's basically comparing a weak magnet with a with a with a hoist. I don't know <laughs> with something which you can pull a car with. Uh, what are your thoughts on the Viper clinical trial? Um, yeah, so pretty complicated regimen. Um, so they they would be. I, I believe we will hear more about it in the upcoming um, in the upcoming um, at upcoming meetings. Um, so I'd say no specific thoughts yet. Yet uh, probably need longer follow up. How do you look at roof? Okay. I think he needs rituxim. Oh, okay. Well, uh, yeah, it's it not as, typically not as a single agent, but as part of the regimen, so well, could be. Um, cyclin D1 negative MCL. Uh, not necessarily. The discussion doesn't really differ. There is this this MCL typically would express cyclin D2, cyclin D3. It becomes a little. Uh, sophisticated, complicated there, but they behave typically in a similar way. Uh, why are bispecific clinics approved for other lymphomas but not a mental cell? Uh, because they've been studied longer for follicular lymphoma. These studies have been ongoing for about eight years, and mental cell has more issues with dosing regimens. Um, it will be approved eventually, but probably will take a few more years. So LOXO-305 piptabrutinib has been approved for mental cell lymphoma, yes. Um, uh, well, um, th so Libby asking a good question, why not use CAR T-cells cell, CAR in the front line? Um, well, that would be a, a good clinical trial and, you know, certainly um, 
it's it's a good it's a very good question which would need to be studied. I think we only have two minutes, and uh, I don't think we <laughs> I don't think we can get to the fifty four. Yeah, I think which, maybe just two two more questions probably. We got a lot yeah. of ones, but yeah. Other than TP53, what can make someone chemo resistant? Well, P53 is the one we know about. There are other mutations uh, which can account for chemo resistance. Uh, uh, there are quite a few of them. Uh, we, we published on that actually quite extensively. I don't think it makes sense to list them here, but there are for sure other mutations which can account for chemo resistance. Are there any BDK inhibitors we would not recommend for an 82-year-old? I'd say I wouldn't use a brutinib, but either zanobrutinib or acalabrutinib should be fine. Um, okay. Immediately disqualify a patient from CAR-T. Um, not really. I guess... Um, uh, so we published on work which, where patients with severe kidney or renal dysfunction did not do so well. Um, mechanical heart valve, heart valve actually should be okay. Yeah, it, there is not really one thing. Yes, you can ask AMD to test for TP53 mutation. Um, yeah. Okay. Great. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Da Dr. Danilov. I think, you know, we have a really engaged audience and this was a really thorough presentation and for anyone who, um, has questions, um, they didn't get answered, um, you can always call our helpline um, and they can connect you to resources. And this session is also being recorded and it'll be sent out to you. Um, so that'll be in your email today or tomorrow and you can review um, all of Dr. Danilov's presentations. So I'd like to thank you so much, um, Dr. Danilov and also to our sponsors again, AstraZeneca, Kite and Merck for making this program possible. Um, and at the conclusion, you'll receive an email prompting you to complete a program evaluation, and we encourage you to do this um, so we can deliver the most useful and meaningful programming to you. So thank you again, Dr. Danilov, and I hope everyone has a wonderful day. Thank you.